Thank you all for, uh, for coming to this panel um, on free and open source software governance. I am extremely, um, so I'll just go and introduce down, down this way, on, um, to immediately to my left um, uh, is uh, Chris Allen Weber, who is the lead developer of uh, GNU Media Goblin, and you may have just heard him speak in this room a moment ago. Um, then we have uh, Stefano Zaccaroli, who's an associate professor at University Paris de Dero, um, and also was Debian project leader for three years. Um, Eileen Evans is uh, vice president and deputy general counsel of cloud computing and open source at Hewlett Packard. And then we've got Chris Anasek, in the, uh, who's the head of open source at Twitter, and Tom Spot Calloway, uh, who is, uh, actually I never got your proper title, but uh, on the open source and standards group at Red Hat. I just crashed this party, I don't know what's <laughs> <laughs> And so the reason these people have been selected is because they all play really interesting and different roles in free and open source software governance. And when um, somebody who was not able to attend FOSDEM proposed this panel, we were sort of like, what an interesting idea. Because often when we talk about governance, it's in these two different areas. We have the nonprofit community side, and we have companies that are operating um, and doing, you know, doing things like trade associations and, and organizing their efforts together. So there's actually like a whole mishmash of responsibilities, and the meaning of what governance is is different to different people in our space. And so these people actually represent a um, a varying range of, of of those experiences. So I think just to kick things off. Um, we're going to go down the, the row, if that's okay, and just say sort of like what your experience base is in um, governance and free and open source software, like, you know, sort of where you're coming from and what your experiences have been in a very general way. And then while they're doing that, think of the questions you want to ask because this is a round table and uh, we want to hear your questions. So we'll start with Chris. Um, and speak up because it's very hard to hear in the back. Oh man, I just figured I'd model my response pattern off of all of these other people. But um, so so uh, I mean so the I've been the kind of lead and maintainer of GNU Media Goblin for a few years now, um, with a project which kind of exploded much faster than I expected it to, uh, and partly forced me to take it more seriously than I expected. Um, we've got a really strong community of contributors that kind of, uh, um, uh, we've had about 75, uh, over 75 of them over the last few years, but they've, uh, um, uh, sometimes you get, and uh, um, yeah, it's been a real pleasure to being able to work with it, um, having people kind of both come in and do incredible amounts of things to people just kind of coming in and making small patches and so on. Um, uh, but I don't know what more to say in a generalist pattern, so I'll pass it over to Stefano. Uh, so yeah, uh, I've been contributing to Debian. It's probably the, the largest pro project in free software. Can you guys hear in the back? I've always you contributed. Speak up. Sorry. Okay, so I've been start contributing to Debian since like '97, and uh, the highest responsibility I've had has been that of project leadership. I've been doing that for three years. Um, what's possibly the most interesting feedback I can give you in a kind of a general way is that when I started doing that, so in a way, and then I ended up in 2010 being Debian project leader, I really had no idea of, of all the different kind of responsibility that there might be in a typical governance role in, uh, in free software. So we tend to believe that it's mostly like, you know, steering the project in one direction or uh, all this kind of stuff, but it's actually more like solving problems and the kind of problems you can end up solving are at all level of uh, knowledge and competence. So you range from absolutely intricate legal issues from more like policy decision from actually even technical stuff. So it's really, really broad and that's kind of what makes it exciting to be in this kind of roles. Uh, so, Eileen Evans. So, at a high level, um, my open source experience really started um, at Sun Microsystems. Eileen, could folks you speak in the room up? hear me? Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Should I stand up? And that's okay. It would probably help. Can you, stand up? Okay. Can, you, can you hear me better from standing up? Great. Okay. <laughs> so, my open source experience really began at Sun Microsystems. I was with, um, had the fortunate experience of, of working with Sun and in the area of open source for uh, nearly 12 years before coming to HP a few years ago. And at Sun, 
I would, started at Sun when it was very in the very early days of open source. Um, it was we were just sort of getting started in open source. Um, I was there when we originally were working in the Java technologies and trying to, you know, figure out how to open source Java. And I know we received some flack for that because you know, and granted, we didn't get it right probably the first time, but nonetheless, you know, I think over you learn from the experiences, and I think we learned from a, from a, a number of the experiences that at least I did at Sun and. I had the opportunity to work in uh, technologies from Java to when we open sourced Solaris. Um, I led the efforts and, and um, helped lead drafting that license and, and getting that project released as an open source project. Um, there were a number of other um, open source communities that I had the opportunity to work in within at, at Sun. And so that really laid the foundation for how I look at open source and open source governance. And then since joining um, HP, um, my current role, it's, uh, for me it's a really fun role because it, it mixes my legal experience and background with my desire to you know, work in the open source community as well. Um, so I lead uh, HP's open source program office and I also have a role uh, leading our legal support for our cloud organizations. So for me it's a really great fun mix of, of using both of those skill sets and experiences that I've had to continue to further and grow in those areas. Um, wi within governance, um, so the open source program office at HP, our role and responsibilities lie in things like compliance and making sure that you know when we're bringing code in um, that we, we comply with the licenses and those kinds of things. But it also involves things like our contributions to open source projects and open source technologies. Um, so it's really important that um, we recognize the importance of contributing um, in meaningful ways to open source communities. So that's something that that I own from, from that perspective as well, which is really fun and exciting. Uh, the other piece that ties into it, which is the nonprofit side, is that when we participate in communities, um, for instance, with respect to OpenStack, we've made a pretty big strategic bet in OpenStack. Um, and I had the opportunity to, to work within that um, project and back in 2011, 2012, when they were deciding to turn it over to a foundation and turned it over to a foundation, um, I had the opportunity to work really closely with a small group of, of um, other lawyers from other companies to help turn the project over to a foundation. So that was sort of that, the other side of governance. And for me, it was interesting to be able to draw on previous experiences I had in order to do that. Um, and now I have the fortunate experience of, of kind of marrying those in some ways because I represent HP on the OpenStack Foundation Board as well as the Linux Foundation Board. So it's, it, it's a, a great opportunity to kind of see both sides of governance and, um, and both sides of that, that contribution process. I guess from my side, I guess I kind of have two hats. One is similar to kind of, you know, I run the Twitter open source office and kind of have the fun job of deciding what communities we uh, both participate in and, and, and support. Um, kind of the other hat kind of involves uh, my open source experience where a long time ago I used to, you know, hack on Gen 2 back in the day, but uh, I spent many, many years, um, you know, at the Eclipse Foundation, both as a kind of committer from the bottom, leading a lot of plugin tools, but also participating um, uh, at the board level. So I think I've been on the board for um, seven, seven years now there. So um, I've had a lot of interesting uh, experience in, in, in kind of, you know, that area where Eclipse is a very unique place where it kind of walks the line between kind of like open source and, and, and corporate support. So since it's a trade association, it needs to make sure it kind of respects, you know, the, the wishes of, it, of its members. And, um, you know, there's one class where it's kind of, you know, companies, and there's another class where it's just uh, committers who could happen to be employed by companies, but also could be contributing on their kind of um, spare time as, as individuals. So it's a lot of interesting, weird experience in, in that governance space. So uh, I've been at Red Hat for 13 years. I've been involved with Fedora for 10. I was the Fedora engineering manager inside Red Hat for five years. Now I'm with the open source and standards team where our whole mission is to go out and make sure that other open source projects, both those that are run directly by Red Hat and those that Red Hat has a big involvement, and even those we just think are really cool and deserve some help, uh, get what they need to be successful. But we try to accelerate them and help them to be as awesome as we know that they can be. And so that's, you know, 50% of my background. And the other 50% is that I've served on basically every technical and non-technical committee that Fedora has at one point <laughs> or another, sort of, you know, in the role of janitor where they handed me a very large mop and said, nobody wants to clean that thing up in the corner we found. Would you go clean it up? And that has led to me being the uh, chair of the packaging committee and the person responsible for handling all of Fedora's legal issues. So I kind of do a little bit of everything all at once. So just to, uh, as a survey of the people on the panel, 
How many of you are, serve on a board of like a board of directors? How many of you are members of a nonprofit organization or voting member of a nonprofit organization? Okay. Let's. Uh, <laughs> what about you guys in the audience? How many people are uh, are on a board of directors? Wow, that's a that's a lot of people. And how many people in here are a member of like a you know like a you know a member of one of the like Gnome Foundation has voting members. How many of people here are members of a foundation? That's awesome. So the very high level of understanding here about um, about governance issues. So you know what? Then I have a few questions, but I'm going to hold them. And instead, who has questions that they want to ask? Yeah. Maybe good to start at the very beginning of the discussion is what is for every one of you uh, governance? What is it about? That's, I suggest a very simple definition. It's putting in place a framework to be in control and to get things done. If you can't can find yourself in this definition, what are, for each of you, the main components of this framework? In three sentences or less. <laughs> <laughs> and if, you, if, if we go down, that leaves more for other people to say. <laughs> so how about we start at that end? Sure, I would say. And no run on sentences. <laughs> My three sentences are the absolute minimum necessary to reflect what people are already doing and do it faster. I'll just do one sentence. Defining the rules of engagement. I'll pass for a moment. <laughs> So actually, I refute your definition because Debian is a really anarchic project in which you know people work by on their own. So it's actually only about removing obstacles for people to be able to work and have fun. That was three sentences. Really? <laughs> <Yeah. Yay. laughs> I don't think I can do anything but ramble. It's just me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's I'm one. The oh, it's two. It's two. <laughs> so, me, my experience, my experience has actually been uh, um, media goblin in in some in some strange ways. It's it, I, me coming up here and sitting in front of this. We have a lot of community members who do a lot of things in a bunch of different ways, but media goblin is kind of a. Um, and in some ways, even against my wishes, a BDFL type project that has like one person who's at, sitting at the front of it, which is me, who's like kind of guided a bunch of things. And uh, it, I, I'm, at, but but <laughs> that's not necessarily how. Uh, um, but I admire a lot of other structures, and would like to learn from them in some ways. So that's like eight sentences, and I'm going to shut up now. Oh yeah, I stop. I forgot to count. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was one. Back to you. <laughs> yeah, very it was just one sentence. long run-on sentence. <laughs> I'm just going to. I'll try to recast a little bit. I think good governance um, is simplicity to help get things done faster. One sentence. Simplicity. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of me. Okay. Yeah, I have a rather simple question. Where do you get funds? <laughs> It's a it's it's a little bit of a side question to uh, talking about governance, but yet it absolutely drives how governance works. So I'll answer this one first, Great. actually. Uh, so Media Goblin is funded by people's donations. Uh, we ran a crowdfunding campaign last year. We're about to run another campaign through the FSF, um, and we and my last year has been based on people donating things. We've also been able to, uh, f we've managed to get in one grant that has another person coming in. Um, but I think we're, by, um, but we're in the, you know, be getting donations, but through a fiscal sponsor, which in our case is the FSF. So why don't we actually go down the, um, the line? Maybe let me quickly um, elaborate one very short and general question. So my uh, question, so I'm the president of a, a FemTech Foundation, and we have um, of things that we could sponsor in you speak multimedia. Up. We have lots of things that we could sponsor in the multimedia community, but we're currently very cash strapped. So we, we're very far from being able to, to sponsor a person to work full time on, on anything, for example. And um, yeah, so five years, I would love to be in a place where we have a few people that we can sponsor. So how do you get from A to B? So, right, so, so I think it will still go down and have people talk about 
the yeah. funding of their the orgs that they're involved with. Um, and the answer to that question, as you'll see, is going to be different depending on what your situation is. So this will hopefully give you an idea of the possible diversity out there. Uh, Chris has already said that he appealed he appeals to small individual donations um, using the ideological drive of the project and spoke quite eloquently about it right before this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Debian is donations as well. We don't have employees, so that's, even if you have the small salaries that take up quite a lot of money on a yearly basis, so we only need money for infrastructure, for sponsoring people traveling, and the big part of our budget is the annual Debian conference, and that conference is mostly sponsored by companies that you know want to see Debian thrive. The rest is individual donations. I'll, I'll look at the question a little differently because at, at HP we actually do sponsor a fair amount of um, foundations. We also sponsor um, various work by individuals within the community and then you know we sponsor various events as well, open source <laughs> events. Um, and we have, you know, so my team we're responsible for um, looking at this holistically and, and we do it quite frankly we go through um, a yearly sort of budget cycle but we also then go back and revise it um, every quarter because again things change very quickly in the open source community in the open source ecosystem so we want to make sure that we are investing the dollars um, where they make sense for the community and where we see um, mostly we're looking at it from the technology perspective right and trying to help advance technologies and open source technologies and support those yeah so from like the corporate perspective t you know Twitter's pretty similar where you know we generally support uh, technologies that essentially we depend on, like, you know, if Linux went away, like, that would be bad. Like, you know, the Apache Foundation, like, all of a sudden you can't download, you know, Hadoop would be pretty sad. So um, that's generally where our, the majority of our money kind of kind of goes. Um, with my Eclipse hat on, um, so Eclipse Foundation is a trade association, so um, it kind of has full, s it also has full staff employees that are basically funded mostly by uh, corporate members, right? And there's different levels of membership depending, you know, how, you know, if you want to be like a strategic member, um, you essentially have to pay X amount, right? If you want to, if you're like a, if you're like a university or, or you know, a not-for-profit, you would pay uh, this amount. Um, that's where the majority of money comes from. There's also, uh, we, we also do take individual donations. So, um, but those fund mostly small things like sending students to, to conferences, right? Or like, you know, um, you know, other miscellaneous infrastructure related upgrades, but the majority of money does come from um, corporate members which actually get a seat in the board depend, uh, depending how much they, uh, you know, depending what level of membership they go for. So, uh, okay. some, some friends of mine... Having volume is just yeah. back, so everybody needs to be louder. We may just have to stand up. Some I'll friends of mine robbed Lufthansa in the 70s, and that's where most of my money came from. <laughs> no, um, uh, Red Hat obviously uh, is a very successful and profitable software company with a reasonably good business model where we continue to make more money and so we do the best that we can to sort of flip that and try and invest our money in other places so uh, part of my role is trying to identify places where uh, they need money, they can put that money to good use and also that I can tie that in into some way that someone at Red Hat goes, why did we give Five hundred dollars to the Lemur Society, and you can go. Well, the Lemurs were thinking about using Linux, and <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it, it's one of those things where we we uh, we can't we can't provide the same level of funding as say a Google does or as an HP does. But uh, we try to be uh, sort of focused on the areas where they're not getting as broadly served by these other things. We're sort of looking past <coughs> the big names that are out there because. Google does a very good job of being active and involved and contributing to the groups that are high on the radar. We're looking for the, the new groups, the smaller areas, the things that are uh, interesting and up and coming is, is where we try and spend a lot of our time. So let me ask a follow-up question to all of you guys. Uh, in your leadership positions, how much does, you know, does money drive the decision-making process of the leadership entities that you are on? And maybe come back the other way. Well, I'd like to be idealistic and say it doesn't, but I think it does. I think that uh, that certainly, uh, you know, Red Hat tries very hard in Fedora, which is sort of the example where I work in, to because Fedora is not a nonprofit; they're not an independent entity. The the marks and everything are owned. I'm by really Red Hat. sorry. I think we should all stand up because I see people in the back are all yeah. continuing to strain. Sorry, sorry. But, uh, I mean, Fedora's not an independent entity. They're not a nonprofit. We researched whether that made sense for us or not, and we ended up deciding that it didn't. Uh, 
for a number of reasons, but at the end of the day, we, we want to make sure that it's not the Red Hat show, that there is a community that gets to make the decisions, and we've put up a, a lot of structure around ensuring that the community gets to decide which direction Fedora goes in, even though there's no money involved. So Red Hat has influence because we pay for almost everything, but at the end of the day, if the community doesn't want to go in a certain direction, it doesn't. From uh, from the Eclipse Foundation point of view, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, it's a trade association, so you know, the strategic members, which are generally large companies, um, you know, get board seats, right? So they get some level uh, of influence there. But there's also uh, built into the bylaws, um, you know, uh, committers, you know, which are people who have like commit access to an Eclipse project could nominate people to represent them uh, on the board, and it's basically a fraction of um, you know uh, the, num the number of you know committers, I guess, out there. Um, such a, from like the Twitter perspective, like uh, money-wise, um, you know, we essentially have a limited budget, you know, on, you know, on an annual basis that we just try to give out to to what makes sense from our point of view. It's all look at this um, from the OpenStack Foundation um, board of directors perspective, uh, because again, in, in working with them to help set up the, the foundation and the bylaws and such, I'm pretty familiar with it. Um, it's interesting because yes, the money does buy certain seats. Like for instance, platinum members have a have a board seat, um, gold. But but I think it's really interesting that the way they set it up because it's a 24 person board. There are eight platinum members, so all of those have board seats. There are eight um, gold seats, and there are more gold seats than um, gold members than gold seats. But nonetheless, that gold voting class elects eight members as well. <coughs> and then there are eight individual members. That's pretty unique in an open source um, foundation such as OpenStack. Um, to have that level of, um, of sort of, if you will, parity, I think it's, it's pretty unique. I mean, to have eight individual directors on there, you have eight gold and eight platinum. So within that board composition, though, they also have some rules in the bylaws. Like, you can have no more than two seats from the same company. Like, for instance, HP can have no more than two seats on the board. Red Hat can have no more than two seats on the board, so they have it kind of set up that way, so you, you avoid that kind of control. So I think as a result, what I've seen is that it, it's pretty, um, and once you're on the board, when you're making board decisions, it's one person, one vote. I mean, and there's there's no sort of disparity about how, um, you see your question? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, you, you said it was unusual, uh, unheard of maybe in these open source foundations. Um, I'd just like to point out that software in the public interest has only individual people as governing members and the board of directors is elected okay so so we're gonna we, we're moving down that row and i think when we get to uh, a debian perspective and a community <laughs> policy, I think we might get to different you know different models okay so um, Lin the, compare that to linux foundation board linux foundation board yes you do ha you also have seats on there based on contribution level but in addition they have individual I think you meant unusual for a trade association for a trade association yeah, yeah, yes yeah. yes to clarify yeah. as opposed yes. to a <laughs> generally yes. which yeah. is what software in the public interest is or the gnome yes. foundation or software yeah. gnome conservancy no but that's yeah. but it's a good point so thanks for calling me on it um as, as far as hp similar we have certain a certain pot of money that <coughs> we're able to um to uh, parse through each year and sort of, you know, finite dollars there, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so as, as Karen anticipated, in Debian situation is kind of different because we do not use Debian money to pay people, so it's not like the money that the Debian project owns have a direct impact on what people work on and what they do not work on. So they can be a limiting factor if you run out of money to buy hardware we need to fix a specific, I don't know, performance problem, but that's not the case. So um, the kind of corporate influence you can have on a project like Debian is very different. It's more like in companies hiring people to work on specific stuff within Debian. That of course might happen, but the solution there is not at the level of money. Usually it's to have enough different companies interested in, in having their work done in Debian so that the different interests like on like balance each other. Go ahead. So so I think for Media Goblin uh, the the we have, so I'm currently paid full time at the moment. And we have a number of people who have been able to be paid as interns or currently as a contractor. We had, you know, s through Summer of Code and Outreach Program for Women, we were able to, you know, get some people to actually be paid and work on things. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, you know, Debian, ha Debian has had that as well, right? right? You know, paid internships are, are, are pretty awesome. But, uh, um, but I think that actually what's interesting to me for Media Goblin is the, the contrast of like what funding decisions we could have made. Um, Media Goblin, you know, is uh, um, is working on something that's trying to be very user freedom focused, 
that's not getting a lot of attention right now. Um, but we, what, what would Media Goblin look like if instead of from, if by getting individual donations, we're able to focus on a lot of put that money towards being very generalized, focus on the, the software becoming, you know, like the best towards the general purpose of where it wanted to be moving forward, right? And that's something that we were able to do. Um, but if we were, what would Media Goblin look like if we had taken a bunch of startup money, right? Or if we, um, and still released it as free software, right? Um, or what would Media Goblin look like if uh, um, we were entirely grant focused, but each grant had very specific requirements of funding, very specific features. And I've worked at nonprofits before where you're, you're very, very grant funded and it's hard to be able to actually move the general thing forward because you're so focused on, we, we have to get the deadlines for you know, this type of grant moving forward. So, so for me, I think I've been very fortunate. Uh, I hope that we're fortunate enough to be able to move forward past uh, uh, with this. But I, what I've been very reflective on: what kind of funding decisions we end up making allow for what kind of work we end up doing. So, right, you would probably say that your that the decision making process drives the money for you. Right. right. Rather than the other way. Right. Because that's how your fundraising is. To that's and that's the way we'd like to be able to see things go. But you know, uh, it, yeah. But they, it. But yeah, the the that those things definitely get interconnected. Um, so, uh, so my question is about uh, transparency, and um, I'm curious uh, since we have such a wide spectrum of organizations here, like maybe what percentage of decision making conversations happen out in the open? And then tell me if you think that's too many in the open, not enough in the open, or just the right amount for your organization, like if, for where you see it going. So let's start in the middle and then wrap around. <laughs> so I mean. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't quite understand the question, I'm sorry. So in terms of transparency, like within my company or within the boards within that Within the serve? boards that the organizations oh, the boards. Okay. that you okay. So for, so for OpenStack. Open okay, let me use OpenStack as an example. Yeah. Because we actually have a transparency committee. I'm part of the transparency committee. So uh, we do have a, a committee that's focused on um, really taking a look at making sure um, everything that we can be transparent about, that we are transparent about. I mean, there's certain things in the bylaws you know, like one example is obviously executive director, like compensation, something like that. We've got to be, you know, there's confidentiality around that. But what we try to do is be as minimalistic as we can in terms of, of things that we believe we have to keep closed. So we try to do as much as we possibly can in the open. I mean, even, even board meetings, you know, we have those in the open and we oftentimes we'll try to send notes out to try to get, encourage more people to participate and, and dial into the board meetings and, and things like that. So we are very focused on, on trying to increase transparency and then we have some mailing list work that we've done as well and we realized you know after kind of going down one path that it might not be as easy for folks to access so let's switch gears and try to create something from a technology point of view that's more transparent so even the the emails and the, the committee stuff we're having that we're doing work we're doing is more open and more transparent because we do find that we get a lot of really good feedback and input the more open we are so I think it's, it's goodness I want to put as a point of order I want to remind everyone that uh, 501c3 charity and um, C6s and uh, a lot of organizations, it depends on how they're organized, are required to report things like executive yes. compensation. So if you want to check out my salary, you can. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to a way to keep executive or, salaries confidential. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, happy with it. I'd love to hear about it. It's, it's got to be, okay, okay, be there. Okay, so maybe it is on. Yeah. But, okay, but, so but it depends on the organization it and how could, it's run. Yes. OIN, for example, is not you know it's not a nonprofit organization and, and nothing yeah, is. Yeah, the publisher. The commercial was mostly about technical decision, I guess. You have to go to the IRS and look at it. Yeah, but I know, I was just addressing, yeah, because uh, yeah. okay, okay. okay. I saw a few, like, I'm confused yeah. expressions. Yeah, okay, I probably shouldn't have used that as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. But, but My the rest of yeah. your, yeah. Yeah. your answer answer full. So let's maybe okay. come down to Stefano, and then we'll go around. Okay, so in, we'll in the Debian Social Contact, there was a point, and there still is a point about we do not hide problem, that I think in the beginning was mostly about technical stuff, but it has definitely grown into being something which is really felt as a social level. So. Of the two extremes you were mentioning, Devin is probably more more on the side of almost too much transparency so in the sense that if legal. someone, yeah, right, <laughs> <laughs> so if someone is trying, if someone will try to do a technical decision under closed door, it will definitely be called out. In fact, we have several really interesting crises long time ago about this kind of stuff. So you're probably following the system D versus upstart saga that's being discussed in a very public manner. <laughs> Oh, that's being discussed now? <laughs> yes. Boy, is it. <laughs> You're probably the only one which is not aware of that. <laughs> Please. Oh, 
Is that right? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, so for Media Goblin, uh, so it's funny to have Deb asking the question because. Uh, um, oh yeah. Okay. So, so actually, so there's, so I think. This, this question kind of gets split in a couple of ways. One of them is the financial side of things, and one of them is kind of the decision-making side of things, right? So uh, on the financial side of things, for the money that we raised, I think John and I talked about it, so I'm assuming it's still okay that I can make this promise that like, I wanted to give a breakdown of how we ended up doing like last year's uh, stuff so that people can actually see that. So we'll be doing that before the next, uh, like, or during the next campaign or something like that. But in the next couple weeks, that'll be coming out. But, uh, um, but the... Uh, there's, there's kind of two sides to the decision making. Most of Media Goblin's decision making is like, it's just a general free software project where people jump on IRC and they jump in there and they're like, hey, I want to work on this type of thing. And we're like, yeah, yeah, like, you know, let's work on that. And uh, the IRC channel is logged during the monthly meeting and then it's not logged otherwise, which is kind of a, which is kind of like, it was like, it made total sense when we started. I've sometimes started to wonder like, oh, there's tons of decisions where it, since it's not publicly blogged, and that's partly because people are like, well, I don't want like my really like, you know, maybe I don't want my employer reading the stuff I say in IRC channels or stuff like that. And that's a genuine privacy concern. When you have so much that's on IRC versus the mailing list, which we do have, that means also that like a lot of Media Goblin's history, I have to search through like a like humongous IRC log that luckily I'm logging to IRC all the time. So, um, so like there's, I, but for the most part, everybody can see anything that we're doing because it's in a public IRC channel and somebody can just jump in there and if they want to be participating in these conversations, almost every technical decision that ends up happening in Media Goblin is somebody jumps into IRC and they're like, they're like, either it's on the bug tracker or on IRC and they're like, I want to do this type of thing. And we're like, okay, let's talk about what the way to move forward on that is. Um, on the other hand, there are some things like the campaign where, you know, uh, the um, Deb and to a lesser extent John and I end up having you know the the, con the, the media goblin conspiracy back channel where we're planning this thing that we're going to end up pushing out into the open and that type of thing ends up uh, um, ends up getting discussed but that's really kind of more of the discussion of like how are we kind of move the kind of boring administrative stuff forward um, but for the most part it's just a public chat project that people just jump on IRC or on the mailing list <coughs> and see stuff man so <laughs> From the uh, Eclipse point of view, I mean, there's 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 a couple hundred projects at Eclipse, and each one kind of runs the way. I mean, there's a development process that they have to follow, but each kind of runs kind of the way they, they want to. But most of the time, you know, based on the infrastructure, like you know, technical discussions happen, you know, over email. Um, you know, bugs and all that stuff get reported to, uh, like Bugzilla, and there's milestones. So all that stuff generally is is public at the board level. Um, we um, we release public, you know, minutes of every every board meeting, you know, every month. Um, and I don't think the the board mailing list is private, so I mean to have discussions amongst board members, so that's not public accessible. Uh, finances, um, you know, with any trade association, you go look up that IRS form online. It's not too hard uh, to find. We do an annual report um, every year based on um, at least how much donations we have raised from the community. Uh, so that's published there and some other some other stats. So I mean we try to be as, I think, as transparent, um, you know, as possible as, as a board, but um, the projects themselves, and there's some counts, councils, too, that kind of do their own thing, um, they generally try to, you know, do their own thing, but, you know, generally it's the right thing of, you know, they publish meeting minutes and, and all that sort of stuff, and activities are transparent, you know. Okay, so to get back to the, um, to the question, um, or the, the part of the question, you, the organizations that you're in, involved in, answer succinctly with either too little, just right, or too much in terms of transparency. So Eileen OpenStack, too much, too little, just right, and transparency. I think they're, I think it's just right, because they're learning and they're doing, they're going the right way. Okay. Just right. Debian? Just right. SPI? Uh, no, I think just right as well. <laughs> okay. Oh, I think it's fine. Can you media goblin? Just right, though we might adjust our IRC habits. FSF? I think just I think we're fine on that. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Fedora. I think we're always I think we're always striving to be just right, and I'd like to say that we get there, but we're not perfect, so we're, we're striving towards just right. How about that? So you say not enough, not too little. I, I, sometimes we're too little, sometimes we're too much. I mean, okay. so it's it's we're we're trying to get that middle ground as best we can. And Chris, uh, Eclipse. I, I think I think it's just right. We could do a little bit more, but you know. It, I think it's it, it it compared to other organizations out there. I think we're doing fine. <laughs> One question. Okay. Yeah. 
so at the, <coughs> at the beginning, uh, I think you were saying that the, uh, the, the role of governance is to uh, eliminate obstacles. And I, I think uh, Tom had mentioned that uh, you know, his view is that governance is as little as possible. So how do you cut through red tape? How do you deal with when, for the best of intentions, you end up with a, situ uh, with a system where you've got so much process uh, for all the right reasons that no one can get anything done? So let's move to ordinary panel That's protocol where people jump in with, the thing, with their thoughts. Um, at least in the Eclipse point of view, um, you know, we 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 essentially revisit you know our development process probably every every few years, and I think last year we uh, went through essentially something called a process diet and kind of went through and overlooked. Okay, do we really need to um, you know do things like you know do we need to hold like a uh, a phone call for like a release review? Like no one attended these like you know public phone calls, so we got rid of them, right? So I mean, I think you know our process is just like every couple of years or few, we'll reevaluate and try to remove things that. Um, that don't, and we have a lot of pressure from our um, committer community, which generally um, absolutely hates any type of um, process. Um, and there's also, I think, a, a pressure from kind of the corporate members who kind of don't mind the process because it helps uh, enforce things like kind of like IP flow and, and other important things that are important to them. So it kind of balances out in the end. Does anybody want to add anything? I mean, for our project, you can just jump on IRC and PM me. <laughs> like, <laughs> and people do all the time. But you're not, you're not C Weber. Yeah. No, I'm not C Weber. <laughs> My username is Paranoia, which is not spelled like paranoia. It is super confusing. Nobody likes it. I think the process point of view, though, is a good question, though, because I think, you know, within the um, organizations that I'm involved with, as well as HP, I think it's one of those things where. In a, at a general sense, with process, it needs to be constantly reevaluated, yeah, yeah. right? And I think as long as you're continually doing that, I think you will continually do improve process. Because I think lack of process is a problem, but too much is a problem. So it's kind of trying to reach that balance. But I think it does require that constant yeah. attention. It, it helps when you have members that have different point of views, which mm -hmm. is good when they push on each other. That's true. Um, we use the word meritocracy often to describe the organizations. The word is seen in a particularly negative light lately, particularly around diversity within organizations. So, yeah. um, so isn't meritocracy wrong for how we govern our organizations, or are we just using the wrong word? So I've actually, at least within Debian, I've popularized quite a bit the word duocracy, which is a kind of a different inflection of the same notion, meaning that you cannot, you know, uh, retain some position of power or some good reputation just because in the past you had your good merits. So the different inflection is based on the fact that you need to keep on doing stuff to, to retain the right of decide how you do things. So I think it's the right notion, but we need to avoid this negative connotation related to, you know, the past glories or the hell of fame that keeps some kind of uh, rights for a very long time. I think in OpenStack we've looked at um, technical meritocracy and when we created the bylaws one of the things that we explicitly wanted to retain was that technical meritocracy within the project. And I think the way that they've done it is the right way in the sense that it's it's co it's not for life. For instance, it's constant. Like the the PTLs, the project technical leads, you have to keep running for re-election. It's not a, it's not a, a given right that because you led one project, you will continue to lead that in in perpetuity. Instead, there's this constant re-election process. The same thing holds true on the technical committee, which is um, so, so. I think that they're trying to to keep that term and use it in a, and <coughs> implement it in a positive way. Um. So I actually think that the, I'm kind of in the same boat as uh, uh, Stefano here, um, though I actually hadn't heard that term distinction. But nonetheless, the idea of you jumping in and actually doing things is how things end up happening is necessary for free software. But there is the, the diversity thing that we do have to take into, uh, into close consideration. So we're, I don't think we should actually remove at all the like people jumping in. What we should be taking into consideration is that there are a lot uh, is the issue of privilege is that you know like we want duocracy we want that but on the other hand it's a lot easier for me to do things as a white cisgendered male um, than it is for a lot of other people right you know like I am like somebody who basically kind of looks like a hacker right like the stereotypical Eric Raymond article right it, it makes it a lot easier for me able to do these types of things so I think I think we need to make it easier for people to actually jump in and take part of the duocracy. That's what we need to be doing. More questions. Um, so it, when you are implementing 
assuming you were there, you each of you, whoever, um, a governance program, uh, what would you say your, were your top, like, one to three priorities, assuming you can't implement everything all at once, kind of going back to that process question a little bit, that were sort of, you know, you're the, oh, this is the first thing we have to get under our belts, and then also what was your biggest stumbling block along the way, or lesson learned? Do you want, uh, well, why don't we just have people jump in as they choose to answer that? When we were setting up Fedora uh, as a project, because Fedora evolved from Red Hat Linux, which was very much a product inside Red Hat, uh, we knew that we wanted the community to have the keys to that particular car, which was something that Red Hat was very unfamiliar with how to do because it never really taken anything they thought was seriously valuable at that scale and sort of handed it off to other people. And there was a lot of concern that because Red Hat depended on Fedora to be successful for Red Hat Enterprise Linux to be successful for Red Hat to continue to exist and make money, that if the community took things in a really bad place that there would be no Red Hat. It would kill everything. And there was all these internal discussions about how do we prevent the community from destroying Fedora, and uh, even before Fedora had a name. And I was a, a strong believer that our community was full of very passionate people who felt as strongly about it as we did. And sure, there were going to be outliers that had crazy ideas, but at the end of the day, if we built a structure where there was a clear way for the community to participate, to be involved, and have control over their own destiny, <laughs> then Red Hat could uh, mitigate its risk by being involved in its own destiny as well, by investing its people and its time and its money in that structure. So when we set up the Fedora board, we set it up in a way to try to balance that concern that Red Hat had about Fedora completely you know, eating itself by giving Red Hat a couple of dedicated seats on the board by putting the Fedora project leader, which is a Red Hat employee, on the board, but by leaving the majority of the seats in the community's hand to elect and determine who sits in that. And I think that it's worked well for us over the years, but if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would cut the Red Hat seats in half because they turned out to be completely unnecessary at all. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on your type of organization. Like in a trade association, you have to balance, you know, um, the different types of membership. Right, so um, you know, in Eclipse, I'm, I don't know if I'm like completely happy with the current balance, but you know, the majority of the membership goes to the corporate, you know, paying members, right, with a smaller um, set reserved for the actual people who actually actually do the work and, and commit on, on projects. So um, I think that's probably the, the trickiest thing to uh, to get, and will basically influence how your kind of community runs for. And an, an open stack. I mean, when we set up the, the foundation. Um, there were 18 companies who signed up, um, you know, this, this commitment letter basically, who signed this commitment letter and decided that they wanted to participate. And this was, you know, April, um, I think 2012, they decided they'd participate in this. Um, and at that time, I think for me as a lawyer, it seemed initially daunting that we would get 18 companies to agree to bylaws, you know, within a pretty short period of time, but we actually did. And I think what helped kind of cut through that was the fact that we agreed on some high-level principles, and then it sort of flowed from there. And I think one of the, the overarching principles were, you know, technical meritocracy, and wanted to maintain that, you know, within the structure. And then the second thing really was around not having any one company or entity with too much control, and that was why we ultimately decided to go with no more than two board seats for any company. Those, I think, were the two key things that helped us. <laughs> so, uh, Chris brought up an interesting point, or a very important point, about privilege. And I think it's a really important issue for uh, FLOSS communities. Um, by some metrics, uh, the number of women in technology today is about 20 or 30 percent. Um, and in FLOSS, that number is much, much lower. It's perhaps one and a half percent. And so my question to for your, each of your organizations are, do you think that diversity is important? And if so, what are you doing about it, and what could you do more? So let's do, maybe let's let's do another like roll call and uh, and, uh, and try to keep answers really, really brief. And so, I'll yeah. start. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle this from two sides. Uh, Red Hat thinks that this problem is very serious and is putting significant money and time and effort into aggressively outreaching to uh, groups and people that aren't normally uh, big parts of our community, specifically women, uh, because we think that we could 
be doing a lot more in a lot of spaces to try and promote the roles that are out there for contributions, both at a code level and at a community level, at a design level, at a UX level. Looking at a lot of the places where, uh, at university levels, where women are far more common than men in some of the programs, but aren't participating in open source, and trying to give them awareness about how they can take the skills that they are comfortable and they have expertise in and bringing those skills over into open source communities, and I think that benefits everyone. From a Fedora perspective, we're actively involved with uh, women's outreach efforts that exist today. We uh, participate in the GNOME women's efforts every time they come around. We're very happy to get that help. Uh, we actively work with uh, various universities around the world to try and promote uh, internships for Fedora, and we actively uh, make an effort to try to keep those as gender balanced as we possibly can. And it's difficult because there's not a lot of women that really want to jump into a lot of the roles that we have traditionally. So we've had to make an extra effort to look at the jobs we have and say, is this a place where we could take this job that was sort of just a hacker programmer job and turn this into something that also has a designer aspect to it or also has a documentation aspect to our community aspect to it. Uh, we have a program at Fedora that's uh, called Fedora Badges. You can go by the Fedora booth and scan a little uh, QR code and get a badge. And uh, a big percentage of the work that's gone into building that infrastructure and that code and the art and the community around it has been driven through women's initiatives and it has resulted in some fantastic work that we're very proud of. Man, from, a, from a Twitter perspective, we have um, an exclusive group for the company, Women in Engineering, that essentially is responsible in trying to change a number of you know women in, in engineering, right? They, uh, have a set budget outside of, you know, like the open source office and, and other groups just to uh, host events, sponsor like Girls Who Code and get involved with all, um, all sorts of other things, do hackathons. They did some like crazy hackathon with Gucci recently. It's just, it's, it's crazy, but you know, there's a dedicated group of people that are pushing that uh, from the open source office, um, you know, part of my budget I'm allocating just to try to improve the number of women in open source, which um, is much harder than, you know, I think the the, the general women in engineering um, um, problem. Um, you know, within HP, I, f I feel incredibly fortunate. I mean, we have a, just a truly amazing woman CEO for the company. Um, and I think we have got some great women role models and leaders within the company. So, so I do feel incredibly fortunate. <coughs> um, and the folks in leadership roles um, at HP have been incredibly supportive of me and supportive of, of other women um, in the organization. So from, from that vantage point, I do feel like, a, you know, and I, I try to do the same. I, you know, um, I have a number of women on my team. I've got it, you know, from a um, proportional perspective, um, folks have made comments that I do. Have, I do have a lot of women on my team. Um, and I think in addition, someone pointed out to me um, just last week that I was the only woman on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors and the only woman on the Linux Foundation Board. Um, I guess the interesting thing to me is I hadn't really noticed that. Um, from the perspective, I guess I don't, th there's times when I'm just sort of <coughs> blinded to that in the sense that I just participate and I'm, and I'm treated like one of the guys, for lack of a better term. But, um, <laughs> but, I, do, but I do think there's that piece of it that is, that's important as well, so I kind of recognize it's a balance. And being a woman in technology and being a woman in open source, um, you know, I'm, I'm, some, I'm more sensitive to it, but at the same time I try to recognize there's a balance to it. So I think the, 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 the problem Tom pointed out is actually fundamental for the survival of communities because monocultures die. So we need to have more mixed cultures and it's not only about women. If you look at this room, it's not only like 99% male, it's, only, it's also 99% white people. It's also people mostly coming from Europe and North America and so on and so forth. So we have a problem of underrepresentation of a lot of communities specifically about women so I'm kind of very happy to be in Debian because we have been kind of leading the effort of you know um, making the environment more uh, attractive for uh, reaching out to uh, minorities <coughs> Debian women as is a sub project within Debian that existed since like 10 years I guess unfortunately the results are not there yet because the, the percentage of people of women in Debian is still as low as you pointed out but we're trying. So two years ago, we passed a diversity statement, and uh, which is meant to be really inclusive of all sort of contribution in Debian from coming from all kinds of people. And uh, we have a, okay, if I can make a small heads, we're gonna have um, um, Debcon, mini DebConf in March in Barcelona, where we encourage specifically to have women speakers to create role models for, uh, for women to speak at Debian events. And actually, you, you reminded me uh, correctly that thanks to Lucas, current leader, which is in the room, so we have 
have been compromising on the fact that we don't, do not pay people to actually pay internship in, from the outreach program for women. So that's possibly the only case in which we decided to use some funds of the Debian project to actually attract more women in the project. Um, so, so first of all, I, for what Media Goblin does, I think there's a few things. First of all, participation in diversity and outreach program, like outreach program for women, and thanks to GNOME for being the, 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 the lead on that. Um, and also projects like Open Hatch, and uh, we also have a code of conduct. Um, and also, I think these types of things are not, like, you can't just set up a number of, like, you just set up, like, just follow this recipe, and then, bam, diversity. It's actually, it's like constant, you have to be constantly working at this. And, and I also rule Media Goblin with an iron fist of kindness. So, like, um, I think you can't improve on that. And we're running out of time, so I think we have time for one more question. Did, unless I, did I cut off your point? I think you made your point. Um, <laughs> I, I do, do want to say one more thing in response to Tom. Sorry, sorry. I do want to say one more thing in response to Tom. There is a new survey that's coming out that's building on the age-old one that we had, and I, I and I, I haven't really seen it. I'm really excited for that survey, and but I worry because it was heavily promoted in the communities where we are succeeding already at diversity. That's true. That it gives a so the number that came out of that survey was 11 percent women, which is still <laughs> abysmal. But I also think it's overrepresentative. Yes, it totally yeah. overrepresentative. Yeah, because a lot of the organizations that were promoting diversity said, we can, you know, like, let, please make sure everybody answers this. And I think that's, <laughs> that skewed the results a little bit. Still, it's a, an improvement, and I think we have improved from the 1%. So, sorry. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh-huh. Yes? Yes. Uh, have you already talked about decision system? Because my English We, we did talk a bit about decision-making mm -hmm. process. Something did you want to ask uh, a specific? Decision by uh, Okay, so the organizations that you guys are involved with, uh, quickly say your uh, what, how the decisions are made. Um, is it by unanimous consent, general referendum, or <laughs> other other possible decision making processes? So. We'll yeah, so very, qui now. very quickly in Debian, it's people doing the work that decide how they do the work by default, but we have a democratic correction. So people can appeal to some kind of general solution where all members of the Debian project can vote and decide on every single map. Chris? Combo, duocracy, and BDFL. Yeah. Iron Fist. Yes. <laughs> Tom? We have a mixture of just about everything <laughs> together. <laughs> okay. Chris? Yeah, it's, a, you know, projects decide, um, you know, they vote. Um, at the board level, there's different, depending what you're voting on, if it's like IP related or requires a, a full majority, if it's not, it requires, a, you know, just, just a normal, normal majority. Ours is a mixture as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, our board is wants to make a sense. I just, I just wanted to jump in and say uh, a big thank you to Bruno Connet who suggested that we have this panel and unfortunately could not be with us. So, and uh, that's one announcement. I have two more announcements. Very briefly, uh, for legal dev room speakers that are hoping to get together tonight, please come up and see me afterwards. And my third announcement is we will start tomorrow at 9 a.m. And thank you very much for coming. And I want to just say that it's amazing to have these leaders in open source software governance. And thank you so much for your participation.